All right, so this series is entitled A More Perfect You, The Pursuit of Perfection in Christ. Uh, this is the lesson number one in the series, entitled Perfection, the Absolute Standard. Perfection, the Absolute Standard. Well, there's, a, there's something wrong with this title of the series, if you can spot it. Something wrong with the title, A More Perfect You. The problem with the title is you cannot have a more perfect something or someone. Let's face it, you're perfect or you're not perfect, right? You can't be more perfect, you're either perfect or you're not. Once something is perfect without blemish, without error, without any imperfection, you can't improve on it. This title comes from a a book, an older book, entitled God's Way to a More Perfect You, Living by the Fruit of the Spirit, Leroy Lawson. And the point that the author makes in the beginning of this particular book is that the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian is what they strive to attain in regards to perfection. Okay? The difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is what each strives to attain when it comes to perfection. So for the non-Christian, let's say for the atheist, the humanist, there is no such thing actually as perfection. Perfection does not exist. So this person has several options when it comes to self-improvement or self-fulfillment. Number one, be the best you can be. Be the best you can be. Maximize your potential using your best skills. Specialize training in physical and mental disciplines. Because you can never be perfect. Maybe you won't ever be the best, but if you are the best that you can be, you have reached your goal and you can live with yourself. <laughs> And doesn't that sound familiar? Haven't we heard these slogans? Haven't we saw, seen books with these kinds of titles? All these self-help things, you know? They're all based on this. Another road that the non-believer, the atheist, the humanist, the socialist, the communist, you know, another road that these people can follow. I'm okay, you're okay. There was even a book that came out with that title a long time ago, I'm okay, you're okay. In other words, I'm good enough the way that I am and you are good enough in the way that you are. There's no striving to be the best or to be better. There's no competition with other people or self. The goal for these people is to accept yourself whenever and wherever you are and accepting others wherever they are. In other words, with this thing here, I'm okay, you're okay, everybody gets a trophy. <laughs> Doesn't that sound familiar? Isn't that how we're running much of public education these days? Everybody gets a trophy. Why? Because I'm okay and you're okay. And what we're going to teach you is how to understand and how to feel good about yourself and how to feel good about other people. And so for those who may have come in a little, a little bit later, the premise here is the difference between believers and non-believers when it comes to perfection is how each of them sees the idea of perfection. Atheists, non-believers, they don't believe in perfection. So the only avenues open to them are be your best self or I'm okay, you're okay. That's pretty much all they can shoot for. Now for those non-Christians who follow Eastern religions, because not everybody's an atheist, a lot of people follow different kinds of religion, Eastern religion, the quest for improvement comes at the cost of totally denying their existence in this world. Okay? So for Eastern religions, the religions of the East they lead their followers through a series of levels of self-denial to the point where they no longer are affected by this world in any significant way. That's perfection. And when this happens, they say that they have perfection 
or they call it wholeness, or they call it nirvana, or they call it moksha, or they call it enlightenment. Whatever, whatever you want to call it, that thing begins to take place. For Jews and Muslims, perfection is less a personal experience and more a corporate experience. Their perfection is tied to the fate of their political aspirations. So when their people finally achieve their national political goals, there will be a fulfillment of their divine spiritual destinies as well. Jews and Muslims, this is how they look at perfection. When their homelands achieve their political aspirations, it will be like heaven on earth, the perfect situation. So if you're a Muslim, Perfection is that Islam has taken over everything and Sharia law rules everything. That's perfection, okay? Now for pagans who worship idols or various forces in nature, perfection does not exist. For them, staying alive and not angering their gods is the best that they can hope for. That's the perfect situation. My God's not mad at me. And I have food to survive and I have a place to stay. That, that's, per, that's perfection. Okay. Then we have Christianity. And remember, as I mentioned before, what we're talking about is perfection. Different people who believe different things, what do they see perfection as? And I've given you a couple of examples here of atheists and humanists and Jews and Islam, so on and so forth. Then we have Christianity, a group of people who not only believe in perfection, they have seen it and strive for it in their personal lives. So unlike the atheist, the humanist, the skeptic, the Christian has seen perfection in Jesus Christ. We've seen what perfection looks like. The Christian can know what a perfect life looks like because Jesus' life and his works and his words have been recorded and preserved by credible witnesses. No Muslim ever said that Muhammad was perfect. They don't base their religion on the fact that Muhammad was perfect because it's just too obvious because of history and you know, witness. They, people have witnessed his lives, the things that he did. He was not a perfect man. The Christians are the only ones who have a perfect leader. Okay. When we compare ourselves to this perfection, Jesus, we realize two things. One, we realize that we are not okay and neither is anyone else. Not in comparison to us, but in comparison to Christ. That's the big eye opener when you really grow up as a Christian, when you really begin to open your eyes and understand Christianity. The first thing that kind of hits you is, whoa, <laughs> I'm really not a good guy. <laughs> I'm really, you know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You read that and you go, oh yeah, sure, all have sinned. But when you really study the life of Christ and His words and His actions and so on and so forth, that, that idea really hits home. You say, boy, in comparison to Him, there is a wide valley of difference here between me and between Him. And another thing we realize is it doesn't matter what level of accomplishment we achieve, our very best is not good enough for Him or in comparison to Him. I don't know about you, but as far as I'm concerned, every once in a while I get it right. I do something, you know, I do something with the right motive, you know, and I follow through and whatever, and then I'm saying to myself, okay, don't mess it up. <laughs> don't, you know, I can feel your head beginning to swell right away. You know, look at me. Yeah. It's very difficult for us as human beings to do a purely good thing, no spoiler in it, no, no sin, no darkness no self-serving motivation, you know, it's very, very difficult, impossible. Unlike those who follow Eastern religions, we realize that no amount of self-denial or mystical exercise can eliminate what causes our imperfection, which is sin. We know that. You cannot overcome lust or envy through yoga. 
I, I spent some time at a monastery when I was very young, before I became a Christian, with the Augustinian monks in Vancouver. And I spent time there. And in my mind, at the time, you know, I was searching, I wanted, you know, I was looking for God, looking, searching, and I thought, oh, these guys, they've got it. You know, they're, they're cloistered, they're monks, they live, they grow their own food. You know, th these are the guys. Until I heard the gossip that was going on among them. Until one of them hit on me. <laughs> Now I'm not saying everybody's like that, I'm just saying my own particular experience in this particular monastery, where I heard people you know, having an attitude about stuff, and what I realized, they're just like me. They've got the long robes and they've got the shaved heads and yeah, they grow their own food and they don't get married, but they're just like me. They shade the truth. They have sexual impulses that they shouldn't have or shouldn't act on. They gossip. <laughs> They're just like me. No amount of yoga takes away lust or dishonesty. Maybe lo lower your blood pressure, but it doesn't affect your morale or morals. Christians also know that until the Lord returns, there will always be unrest among the nations and strife between those who follow Christ and those who don't. So perfection through peace among the nations, that's not going to happen. I mean, it's okay that we try, that we you know, try to lower the temperature between nations, that we don't provoke one another and all that business, of course. But what did Jesus say? There will be wars and rumors of wars all the time. Disciples of Jesus are not afraid of knowing their God for He is kind and merciful. We can hope for good things in our lives given to us by a loving God who cares for us, but we also know that perfection is not based on riches no matter how much God blesses us. The Jews of Jesus' time were under the impression that the more you had, the more physical riches, wealth that you had, the more that you were blessed by God. Like you were, he liked you more than he liked the poor person. But we know that's not true. So we can see how we are different from others when it comes to the idea of perfection. So the next question then is, what is our attitude and approach to perfection? So we've talked about this, these other believers, these other religions, what's our attitude? Well, our attitude is that perfection is the absolute standard of the Christian life. What is the standard? What is the standard that you live by? Yeah, perfection, that's the standard. Atheists deny it, humanists compromise it, various religions change its meaning to acquire it on their own terms. But Christians strive for and embrace perfection in its purest form because we are called to do so by Christ. What does he say in Matthew 5, 48? Be perfect therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. So Christianity has the unique belief and practice that absolute perfection is the standard by which we judge our lives. It's not an easy thing, is it? Now this would be absolute hypocrisy if we thought that we achieved this level and condemned others for failing to achieve what we achieved. This is one of the reasons why people who are not Christians often label Christians as hypocrites. You guys are just a bunch of hypocrites. Because we're, we're, we're aspiring to the standard by which we live, which is perfection. What they don't understand is that we know we can't achieve that perfection, but we aspire for it. They don't quite understand that dichotomy. So Christian understands that what we do is strive to attain what is unattainable in this life, but will be accomplished in the next. So the actual effort to achieve perfection, even though we can't fully attain it now, is the expression of faith we offer to the one who is perfect and whose perfection we seek, Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus is the Son of God, show me 
well, I'm attaining to the perfection that he has. I'm basing my decisions on reaching the perfection that he has. That's how I show him I believe. In other words, we try to be perfect like Jesus as a way of showing our faith in him. This effort not only blesses our lives, but it pleases God who de desires that all believe in Christ. So we believe in perfection. We realize that we are not perfect. However, we strive for Christ's perfection as an expression of faith and love for him. We can't give him money. I know we put money in the plate, but you know what I'm saying? We can't give him money. We can't go hug him. How do we, how do we show we love him? and that we truly believe in Him. Well, we aspire to His perfection. Perfection is a choice. So we said, what is the Christian's attitude and approach to perfection? Well, it's the standard by which we live. And secondly, is a choice. Choosing to strive for perfection is not something that you simply decide to do one day. It is an option given to those who are freed from sin through the blood of Christ. People who don't have the Spirit of God, you know, they'll go nuts trying to achieve the perfection of Christ. You see, people without Christ will inevitably go the I'm okay, you're okay route. Or maybe they'll strive for the personal best way of life. But they will never choose to strive after perfection because they know it is unattainable or simply doesn't exist. You know, people, when they really mess up, non-believers, what do they usually say? Well, nobody's perfect, as if that's some kind of defense. Nobody's perfect. Well, of course nobody's perfect. But Christians can't say that. Christians can't use that as an excuse. Why? Because we're, at, we're, we're aspiring for perfection. So when a person comes to know Christ, that person comes into contact with godly perfection in human form. And this has several effects. First of all, it confirms their own imperfection. No matter what they, they may have thought about themselves before, they now know for sure that they fall terribly short of perfection. That's the first thing that you figure out when you begin to know Christ. Secondly, it gives us a vision a vision of what actual perfection looks like and sounds like in human form, something that we could not know before our faith in Christ. I know what, I know what perfection looks like, it looks like Jesus. What does perfection look like in dealing with one's enemies? I just have to study the life of Jesus. Thirdly, it provides a definitive measure for progress in the process of improving oneself. How much more am I like Christ this year than I was last year? Don't go day to day, it's, yeah. How am I doing this year compared to last year? How am I doing in this block of 10 years in comparison to 10 years ago? If I can see what true human perfection is and what my own true condition is, then I, I can calculate the improvement I'm making in my own life. It's okay to be happy for the fact that you're better than you were last year. There's some things that you've managed to you know, do away with which you, you know, were not Christ-like, absolutely. And of course, contact with the perfection of Christ, it offers us a choice. Seeing perfection and imperfection moves a person to make a choice. You can continue to live and reinforce all of the imperfect thoughts and actions that you do each day, which only leads to greater degrees of imperfection, or you can choose to pursue perfection by following the teachings and examples of the perfect one, Jesus Christ. You know, we, we say we become Christians when we're baptized and that's true. And that's really the easiest thing of all to do, to, to go and to be immersed in the water. But that's just the first step. You know, what, what's step two, three, four, five? Well, step two, three, four, five is getting an actual vision of who Christ is and then beginning to emulate our lives. So the passage on which this series is built, Galatians 5, 13 to 25, outlines this choice and the consequences that follow. 
Those who are saved by Christ are free from the certain eternal death and decay that awaited them as imperfect sinners. And now that they are free, Christians must choose to follow all of the paths of imperfection that you know, I spoke of before, you know, I'm okay, you're okay, and personal best, religious compromise, whatever, to follow those paths, or the path of perfection. Now in this passage, Paul will explain that those who choose the path of continued imperfection expressed in immoral acts and unfaithful habits, these people will perish because of these. And the people who strive after perfection will achieve it. Imagine, they'll achieve it. Now what's interesting is how Paul describes the attributes of perfection. Paul says that perfection is expressed in virtues such as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and this is not an exhaustive list. It's a sampling of what perfection is supposed to look like in a person. We see perfection as in a negative way. We see it as, I don't make any mistakes. Okay. Uh, which is true. The Bible describes perfection in positive terms, what it is that you are doing as a Christian. <clears throat> Virtues, love, joy, peace, patience, you know, when those begin to be present in your life. Peter in 2 Peter 1, 5-7 also describes this process of seeking after perfection using other qualities. He talks about faith and moral excellence and knowledge and perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness and so on and so forth. Those are also attributes of perfection. I suppose that if we had to, we could go through the New Testament and create a list of character virtues and actions that would fully describe the perfect person. But it is easier to summarize all of these in one word, Christ-likeness. Christ likeness. So going back to my original point, we have a choice once we have been saved from sin and death and condemnation through Christ. A choice that Paul explains in Galatians 5.13 to 25. That's on one hand. So we can choose to go back to striving after imperfection which characterized our old life, our old thinking, or we can choose to strive after perfection, which is characterized by Christ in the Bible and Christ-likeness in our daily lives. That's the, uh, what's the word? I hate to use the idea work, but that's the process that we go through as Christians. You know, what do I do? What, what am I supposed to be doing as a Christian? Okay, uh, well, I know I'm supposed to go to church, but going to church is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end, going to church uh, allows us the opportunity not only to pay our homage to God, to Christ, but also it's in church that we learn about God's word. It's in church that we learn about what am I supposed to be doing as a Christian, you know, because this is where the Bible is taught, supposed to be anyways. So if we choose to pursue perfection, and we shouldn't be embarrassed about this. That's what we're supposed to do as Christians. Oh, you guys think you're perfect. No, but I'm striving for it. That's my comeback answer. Yeah, I'm not perfect, but I'm shooting for it. And I don't have to apologize for that. Why? Well, because that's what I'm supposed to be doing as a Christian. So if I choose to pursue perfection, then you know, I need to understand some of the ground rules in order to avoid confusion and discouragement, all right? There are two kinds of perfection. One is conditional perfection. Conditional perfection is the state we find ourselves in when we are saved. When we are baptized, all of our sins are washed away and in God's eyes, here it is, in God's eyes we are considered perfect. That's conditional perfection. In Galatians 3, 26 and 7, Paul says, everyone baptized into Christ becomes a son or daughter of God and thus considered perfect. Our perfect condition is bestowed upon us as a gift from God based on our faith in Jesus Christ. 
Every Christian has conditional perfection because of grace and it is conferred on him, on her, at the point of salvation, in baptism. This is what gives each Christian confidence to face God in prayer, confidence to try and serve God, confidence to face death. Our knowledge of our imperfection would paralyze us before God in each of these situations if it weren't for the conditional perfection He bestows upon us through Christ when we are saved. I tell people, the day that you were saved, you're not going to get any more saved than on that day. <laughs> you, were, you were baptized 59 years ago, that you are no more saved today than you were 59 years ago. Why? Because God bestowed upon you conditional perfection at that time. You don't get any more saved. I wish we would understand that. Then there's another type of perfection called actual perfection. Actual perfection is the concrete and visible progress we make in our lives as we pursue Christ likeness. See the difference? Actual perfection. It's the measurable improvement we make in transforming our old selves into the new image of Christ in our lives. Actual perfection is visible. For example, when we overcome a bad habit, that's actual perfection being instilled in us. When we grow in biblical knowledge and understanding, when we learn to truly forgive, when we develop our ministry skill, a thousand different ways that we grow in actual perfection. Here's the confusion. The confusion occurs when people try to achieve conditional perfection through the practice and striving for actual perfection. We're considered perfect in God's eyes the day we go down in the waters of baptism and come out. We're considered perfect in God's eyes. We can't do anything to be more perfect, more saved. The rest of our lives is devoted to obtaining actual perfection. Why? To get ourselves saved? No. In order to demonstrate our faith and our love to God. We're saved because God considered us perfect in Christ because of our faith, not because we have achieved a certain level of actual perfection. That's salvation by works and it doesn't work. To use another doctrinal phrase, conditional perfection is when we are justified. We are justified before God. Actual perfection is the process of sanctification that we go through our entire lives. The natural question arises, well, if I'm considered perfect in Christ, why bother seeking actual perfection? Why bother? I got it. I'm good. Now, if we went straight to heaven at the moment of baptism, this would be fine. But the majority of us have a certain amount of time to spend on this earth within this body of flesh before we meet Christ. And this brings us back to our original passage in Galatians 5, where Paul asks the question of Christians, how will I spend the rest of my life? Repeating the old acts of imperfection leading to less and less perfection or pursuing the new goal of perfection which has been revealed to me in Christ. You see, there's no neutral ground. You're doing one or the other. As Christians, God calls us to pursue perfection in Christ, not so we can win salvation, because we already are, we're already considered perfect, thus saved in Him. We already got that. Not so we can consider ourselves better or superior than others. This is where that accusation from non-Christians, God, you people are hypocrites, you think you're better than me, you know. It's, they don't understand. No, Christians pursue actual perfection for several reasons. First of all, we do so to continually express our faith in the perfect one, 
Jesus Christ. I believe in you, Jesus. Yeah, show me. I'm doing my best to obey you. I'm striving for perfection every day in every way that I know how. Another reason, we do so to provide a witness of perfection and light to a dark world. Others can see a glimpse of Christ in us. The more actual perfection, the brighter the light. Was it the, uh, that group of Indo the Mennonites where that guy went in and murdered all those children? went into one of their schools several years ago, murdered those, just shot them dead. And of course it made a big blow up in the papers, as it should, it was a terrible tragedy. These little children, you know, little first graders, just cold blooded, killed them. Anyways, they had the funeral for the, and then the guy killed himself. They had the funeral for the kids, but the quote elders of, of, of that community, the, the religious elders of that community, also attended the funeral of the killer. They also started a fund in order to pay for the education of the killer's children who were innocent, who had done nothing wrong. Those elders did everything to reach out and try to show their forgiveness and their love to the killer's family. Not just the elders, but that community and people were amazed, just for one brief moment, the, the pundits and people were saying, now that's true Christianity. Yeah, you better believe that's true Christianity. Wow, you know, we've just seen something that we rarely see, absolutely. What did they just see? They just saw a glimpse of the light. That's what perfection looks like in the matter of forgiving your enemy. How easy would it be, how easy, how difficult would it be to go to the funeral of the person who murdered your grandchild? I mean, think about that for a second. But for one brief moment, that light shone so brightly that it overcame you know, the fact that these individuals had funny habits and they dressed in a strange way and they kept to themselves and they're usually ridiculed, but for that one bright moment, whoa, the light was shining so brightly that no one could deny it. Well, that's what we're called to do. Those bright moments of light that shine, that light up the darkness with our life. We pursue perfection to experience to a degree the perfect life of Christ. I mean, sometimes I get it right. And when I do, it feels heavenly. <laughs> I rejoice, it's just for a moment sometimes, it's just for a part of a day. It's like, you know, whoa, it's like walking on water, you know, until uh, you know, my flesh brings me back to earth. We do so to create the tone and texture of the communal life in the church here that will exist in perfection when the church is brought to heaven. We do so to guard our souls from the continual opposite pull of this imperfect world, as far as Bible study is concerned. If you're a regular, you know, if you're a regular member and you attend regularly, that means each week you receive, uh, let's see, uh, 30, uh, an hour, you receive an hour and a half, two hours. You receive two hours of biblical instruction minus having to leave to go tend to your child or <laughs> you know, your email buzzes you in the middle of the service and you're checking it out, you know what I mean? But you get two hours anyways. Compare that to the amount of hours you spend in front of the television set or Facebook or computer games or you know, whatever. And you'll see that that's not much. But that study guards our soul from the pull of the world. We do so because it is the most perfect thing we who are imperfect in an imperfect world can do. It is the answer to the question, what will I do with my life? Answer, I will seek perfection in Christ. Uh, my husband just died, what will I do with my life? Well, I will carry on as a widow pursuing perfection in Christ. I've lost my job, I've just retired, I don't have the same standard of living that I used to have, what will I do with my life? 
Well, I'm get used to a lower standard of living and continue pursuing perfection in Christ because the steady, the north star of our Christian living is I continue to pursue perfection until the Lord calls me. And we do so because striving for perfection provides the greatest tangible rewards here and in the world to come. Nothing gives more security, nothing develops a greater sense of peace of mind, nothing, not money, not anything, than knowing that we are doing what God wants us to do. When you have that peace of mind, you can face anything. In other words, we do it because we know that we will eventually become perfect. Okay, so that's an introductory lesson on this series. Next week we're going to talk about what God provides in our pursuit of, of perfection. We're going to see what the Lord provides to help us in this quest. All right, that's it for now. Thank you very much.